morning. I invite you to turn with me to Micah chapter 2. This morning I'll read verses 6 through 13. Almighty God, we thank you that you have been faithful and you will always be faithful. Your faithfulness is indeed great. And Lord, we thank you that we have so many proofs and testimonies of it in your scriptures. Lord, we pray that as your Bible is read now and worship, Lord, that we would hear about your faithfulness. And Lord, being given ears that hear by you, that Lord, we would truly know. And Father, we pray that the preaching that follows it would be blessed by you in accordance with its faithfulness to your word. Father, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Micah chapter 2, beginning with verse 6, the word of God. Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? But lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest. Because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction. If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. This ends the reading of God's Word. Sometimes, when we read a passage like that, that seems to have abrupt changes in who is speaking and who is saying what and who is speaking to whom, and whether it's a speech of judgment or all of a sudden blessing, we just kind of get confused. We feel like we're on a carousel and uh, the scene is constantly changing and we don't know if it all ties together. And sometimes I confess that when we look at first glance at a part of one of these minor prophets or even some of the major ones, a chapter will feel to us kind of like a chapter from the book of Proverbs with a lot of almost disassociated notions kind of vying for our attention. So here we have statements about bad preaching and, and bad preachers and the crimes of people and we have a statement of judgment that people are going to be going out and not resting because of terrible destructive behavior. And suddenly, abruptly, there's this picture of, well, but God's going to lead some people out and there's going to be a wonderful uh, king who leads this uh, victorious people out, breaking a siege and crashing through a gate, scattering the enemy and having life. And how does it all fit together? Well, when we look at Micah chapter 2, and remember, chapters 1 and 2 of Micah are the, really the first third of the book of Micah, and it consists of a four-part speech in which there is sort of an indictment, there is a general uh, charge against uh, what God's people have been doing. They've forgotten God, right? They have built their whole culture and their life not on keeping God at the center of it, but of pursuing uh, pleasure and power represented by Baal and Asherah poles. And they have, uh, we saw last week, they have uh, in chapter 2 in verses 1 through 5, the specifics of their sin are truly terrible. They are absolutely committed to the exercise of power and the pursuit of their pleasure without any grounding in anything like a biblical morality that reflects the person and the character of God. And chapter Two, beginning with verse 6, is the last uh, of the four parts in that first message that Micah delivers. And in this last part of that message, he offers two different paths. One is a path that leads to exile. It is 
kind of underscored and best described in verse 10. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest. And keep in mind, rest is of great significance in the Old Testament. It's the whole idea of a Sabbath. The land is given to Israel as a place to rest after their wilderness wanderings. This is no place for you to enjoy the covenant blessings of your God because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction. So on the one hand, one of the paths is a path that leads to exile. A judgment of a just God against a sinful nation. And the other path, the other path is one that really begins in verse 12. I will assemble you, and there is going to be in verse 13, uh, one who opens a breach. Now, this, is, this whole passage has echoes of Zechariah 14. It, uh, it envisions a people prior to a, uh, the defeat of their city and being carried off into captivity. It's, imagine a picture of a besieged city. And the walls at some point that you thought were your protection really become your prison as you're running out of food, wondering what to do. And the picture here is one of a king, a good king, who takes it upon himself to lead the charge, to break through a gate, destroy the enemy who is now guarding the gates of your prison carefully so that you all starve to death and they can eradicate you, and passes through on their head, uh, breaking through the gate and going out by it, opening up a way of freedom and escape from the trap of the world that we have been living in. So there's, there's two paths. One is a path that's going to lead to exile. The other is a path of escape that is being led by a king. And I want to help us understand this last part of Micah's first oracle as really a contrast between those two paths. And the first path can be described as being premised on bad theology, encouraged by bad preaching, and deserved by bad behavior. So it's a bad path, in case you didn't notice. I'm using a highly technical word there, bad. Bad theology. Underneath of the statement, don't preach this way, lies a conviction. Look at verse 6. Do not preach, they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. And here's the rationale for it. Should this be said, O house of Jacob, that the Lord has grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? Now, there's been a lot of things spilled on where and when the protests of the secular pagan people living in Jerusalem at that time, where their thinking begins and ends, but it really doesn't, doesn't really make a difference in outcome. And let me explain that to you. Notice, should it be said, has the Lord grown impatient? You know, should it be said when we're preaching, God is angry at His people? That's a question. And whether that is a question that is specifically coming from opposition to Micah's ministry, or from Micah himself, the question stands before you as one requiring answers. I remind you that the book of Hebrews is a book in which the Holy Spirit-inspired author of that book says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He says that to the church. Jesus rebuked his people. The Holy Spirit speaking through Paul rebuked his people. Come to your senses, stop sinning, and do as you know is right. For there are some who don't know the Lord. You know, we have all kinds of pictures of this happening, but we also have all kinds of pictures in the Old Testament. Azariah from the book of uh, Amos comes to mind in chapter 7 where uh, that false prophet of the northern kingdom says the exact same thing to Amos. Stop preaching bad things. God isn't a God who gets angry at his people. Don't say, you know, God is a God who does good things for his people that they will prosper. Don't be preaching about judgment and wrath to come. The theology that lies at the heart of this is that God's love stands alone and is not tempered at all with a fatherly displeasure or willingness to discipline His people. 
the bad theology rests in the fact that we think God is kind of like a cosmic teddy bear or a good uncle who will never find fault with anything his nephew or niece ever does. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. It's interesting to me that the Bible commends to us as Christians in the New Testament to find out what pleases the Lord, meaning that we can do things that displease the Lord. And this is a part of theology that we often, in our almost exclusive emphasis on grace and love, neglect to such a point that we only want sermons that reflect the strawberries and cream of what the Bible says. Now this, this came up famously in some circles 15 years ago. 15 years ago there was a, a I can't remember now if it was a podcast or a, there's a radio show, the White, Por the White Horse Inn. I don't know if some of you know it. It's hosted by Michael Horton from down in Westminster and Escondido. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, very, it's a solid source for getting material to think about in your Christian life. But they were interviewing Robert Schuller of Robert Schuller fame. <laughs> and they were talking about justification. And remember that the Bible teaches us that when we're justified, the wrath of a holy God against sin is appeased. Okay, that's an idea that doesn't come through in a whole lot of preaching across the land. That God is wrathful against sin and he needs to his wrath against our sin needs to be appeased. That it was a judgment that Jesus suffered on the cross. And Robert Schuller said, I would never preach about such things. I would never preach about the sinfulness of sin or the wrath of God. Because I want to attract people. And you can find his exact words. I think I very faithfully paraphrased him. Uh, that idea is so current. And even where the idea is rejected by preachers, often the idea is nonetheless practiced by the same preachers who theoretically reject it. I want you to think about that. How many sins do you reject on principle and yet you practice those very sins? You know things are wrong and yet you find yourself acting in those venues. Whether it's being impatient and snapping at your spouse or your kids. Whether it's being covetous of what your neighbor has. Whether it's being lustful it happens all the time. And beloved, it happens to preachers. We as preachers experience great pressure to stay positive. Not to preach such things as the judgment of God against sin. And if we do make sure that it's a sermon against the sins of people who are not in the room. You see, bad theology supports an idea that since God is not just and He's not a judge, I can do whatever I want because I'm one of His people and no matter what I do, I'm good. <laughs> Bad preaching that says don't preach on God's justice and His judgment against sin encourages it. It encourages it. I will never, as long as I live, forget something that happened in my ministry when I was licensed to preach by the Orthodox Presbyterian Church back in Maryland when I was in my early 20s. There was a very, very large singles group. It was called Out of the Cellar in Annapolis, Maryland. And I don't know exactly, I, I think they knew who I was because I had spoken two years in a row at a Christian medical student. Um, it was all the medical students in the, in the the MD programs from Johns Hopkins and Maryland and one other school. And I would speak at their uh, winter retreat. I did that two years in a row. And some of those people were single living in the Annapolis, Maryland area. That's the capital of Maryland. And they started a singles ministry that met in a basement. They called it out of the cellar because it got so big 
that it had to uh, rent a, a lecture hall at the Anne Arundel Community College. And by that time, it was at least 100 young people, all single, all in their 20s. And it was kind of a strict group in one respect, that once you got married, you had to leave the group. <laughs> and uh, it was only if you turned 30, you had to leave the group. But it was a very focused group, and it was one of the most exciting groups of people I ever ministered to. I was their every other week speaker. So, and then the weeks in between would have local pastors. And I was in my 20s myself, and they would, they would have praise and worship for like an hour. They would want me to preach for like an hour. And then they'd all go to a local restaurant or something and take up a back room and break out guitars and hang out till 2 in the morning, just fellowshipping. It was, it was really a remarkable thing to be a part of when I was young. But one, one night, I was speaking from Philippians. And I was speaking about the need to be pure. And there were three girls in their 20s, single girls, kind of in the front row on my right, that started crying. And after we were done and I closed with prayer, they were just sobbing. And I, I said, is there something the matter? And one of them said, no one ever told us that sex outside of marriage was a sin. Now these were girls that grew up in a church. And it shocked me to my core that we as pastors, we want to avoid difficult subjects, sensitive issues, burdensome messages, and we do a lot of damage. A lot of damage. Because by our selectivity, by our own desire to be liked and appreciated and considered always positive, we encourage people through their ignorance perhaps to act in ways that are contrary to the word and will of God and in ways that ultimately, whether they know it now or find out later, but by the grace of God greatly diminish their joy and their own happiness. path to spiritual exile and eternal loneliness is premised on bad theology that says God doesn't really care what you do. He's just trying to make you happy. You're one of His people. Just live your life. It's encouraged by bad preaching that says, hey, God doesn't want me to be telling you about things that aren't going to make you feel good. And it is deserved by bad behavior that results. Think about this. But lately, verse 8, my people have risen up as an enemy. Now this is Micah sharing direct quotations from God, as it were. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. Okay. I want you to think about how often we think that sometimes God only cares about the widows, the orphans, and the poor. The poor don't have a rich robe. And God didn't stutter here. You see, it's about power, not just wealth. Even people who have really nice clothes and live in really nice houses can be completely destroyed by society that simply is overwhelmingly focused on power and pleasure and can take away from their neighbor and do so. We just exercise our power however we want. If I can get away with it, I'm going to do it. With no thought of going to war. With no thought of war. There's no pretext. There's no, there's no thought of any retribution or reprisal. I can simply do it and get away with it. It's the life that is lived by the mantra, no cop, no stop. No God, no standard. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses, from their young children you take away my splendor forever. These are families that own their own land. And it sounds like from the description and what we know about other texts dealing with the ancient Near East, this is a description of how widows were so mistreated. And widows and the children who by ancient laws, often if you were without a father, you were considered an orphan. Uh, and you had very little recourse in public court. At the town gate, you were alone. 
And so you got your property taken from you. And now all of a sudden, from the young children, the splendor or the inheritance, it could be translated, of God, who gave that family land, is taken forever. People have no regard for others who are going through times of difficulty in their life. Bereavement. A lack of power. Arise and go, this is not a place for you, God says. This is no place for rest. Because of uncleanness that destroys me, grievous destruction. And what could be more grievous than not caring at all about your neighbors in your covenant community who are disadvantaged and only seeing opportunities for your own benefit from their suffering? What could be more grievous and destructive than thinking that whatever you can get away with is therefore right. Last week we saw from the first part of this about how the shamelessness of people who build their life on any premise other than the living God's character and will, they'll spend the night time devising evil and wake up in the morning and execute the plan. Utterly shameless. No regard for who sees. Because God... He's not a judge at all. He's just a cosmic teddy bear. Whatever you do, He's going to be happy. And that's a problem. Happy, friendly, encouraging sermons are a delight to preach. When that is all that is ever preached, I wonder if they are not a roadmap straight to hell. There's another road. There's another road, dear Christian. It is a road that is not built on a false model of God. It is not encouraged by shallow, lopsided preaching. And it is not even premised on your own behavior. There's a terrible indictment in verse 11. Verse 11, it says, If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. And that's a statement that has actually been echoed in many, many, maybe every generation of Christianity. I remember reading in the 17th century Puritans, their way of describing this was preachers who offered nothing but chalk and mushrooms. And I've always wondered why chalk and mushrooms were considered to be the substance of bad preaching. But just whatever tickles the ears of the people that want to hear. That the preacher should be intimately and intensely concerned with what do people want me to say? Well, in this day and age, the people who preach of wine and strong drink we say, pursue your pleasure to whatever capacity you have the power to do so. Well, that's the preacher for this people. And that's the preacher for the West today, I'm afraid. <clears throat> but the preacher who is not of that ilk is the preacher who declares a message that's summarized by verses 12 and 13. This is that second way. Speaking for God, I, God, will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob, I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. So God here is saying that I am a God who redeems a people. And it's a lot of people. I will surely. It's what God is going to do. God is the God whose character is such that He will never leave people in a position where they are without hope in finding and knowing Him. God will never leave you in a situation where you're so confused and misled that you cannot find Him if you seek Him. And God also has ordained that you be encouraged by preaching that declares what God will do. Micah is not one of those preachers who preaches about strong drink. He preaches about a strong God. 
And Micah, in a sense, is juxtaposing his own preaching ministry with that of those who preach about strong drink by preaching about a God who is a mighty king who breaks out, subduing an enemy, and rescuing a people. And preaching that talks about the reality of the conflict we are in, the intensity of the spiritual engagement of the human being, the individual, of you yourself, the guilt of sin and the beauty of grace. That is preaching that encourages does it not encourage you to take one more step forward in your walk with Christ? To close with Him who alone is worthy? And that's the beauty of the conclusion of this description of Micah's preaching. He who opens the breach goes up before them. I love military history. I, I really love it. In fact, I was dreaming about it Friday night. I, I was telling Marilyn I had this bizarre dream. I was in my parents' house. I was a college student. And I was sitting on my bedroom floor reading a book about World War II, and all my teeth fell out. So you can tell me what that dream means. I have no idea. But you wake up in the morning, you're like, do I still have my teeth? And I went downstairs in my dream and told my parents, and Mom said, what did you do? Which is what mothers do when sons hurt themselves. But in any event, I love military history. And during the time of the Napoleonic conflict, where Duke Wellington was mustering his army and they were in Lisbon and Portugal and they were pushing the, the, the French uh, imperialists out of the Iberian Peninsula. There was a problem with breaching city walls. And they, had a, they would put together special units called a forlorn hope. Has anybody ever heard that phrase? And anybody that wanted to could volunteer to be a part of the Forlorn Lord Hope. The first person to successfully scale the wall, maybe it had been breached by cannon fire, maybe they were using scale. The first person to do that would be guaranteed a commission and rise from the ranks of maybe private all the way up to the equivalent of a second lieutenant. Because the first person to engage the enemy at the critical point was almost certainly going to die. So they took volunteers to do it. People who had no hope, but thought, if I manage to live somehow, I'll survive. Now, I want you to think now, let's go back from the year 1803 all the way back to 800 BC. If you're trapped in a city, and the gates of that city are specifically well guarded by the enemy on the outside because they know the longer they keep you contained in that city under siege, the weaker you'll get until you all die of hunger or surrender. Who is going to lead that charge? Who's going to lead that charge to rescue you from the doomed city? He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. I know some of you younger people love the Lord of the Rings. Think Helm's Deep. And think of your life as spiritually you're trapped in a fortress, surrounded by a sinful culture that would overwhelm your soul with temptation, with agony, with sin, with shame. And it's Christ Himself who says to you, follow Me, because I know the way out of here and I can beat the enemy. That's precisely what Jesus did. And in His ministry on this earth, in His preaching, His obedience to God, His caring for people, and ultimately in His death, Satan himself fell like a lightning bolt from heaven. You can follow the world with its message that says, do whatever you can to be as happy as possible. Which is no more or less than worshiping Baal and Astro, two pagan deities. Or you can worship the living God and follow that great redeeming King, Jesus, who breaks the grip of this fallen world and puts us together with His people in safe pasture. And how do we do that? We do that by repenting and believing. We are translated from the one road to the other, from the one army to the other, from the one 
uh, flock of goats to the other flock of sheep simply by saying, Lord, my behavior has merited in the exile. I have listened to voices that have encouraged just a, a, a wanton, selfish life. I have believed things about you that simply aren't true. Lord, now I would follow you. I would accept that you are the only one who can secure for me a good life. I cannot do it on my own. I will never be happy, no matter how much pleasure I derive or how much power I amass. I need for you to assemble me as one of your people, and then I will have a pleasant fold and a good pasture. And I would listen to voices, whether it's my devotional reading or the church I attend, that declare to me the whole counsel of God and tell me who you are and what you would will for me. And I will keep Jesus ever before me as my Savior and my Lord. Almighty God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that it is a two-edged sword. Lord, we thank You that even as a child by grace adopted into Your family, Lord, I can read Your Word and it can cut me deep, bring me to repentance, and Lord, it can comfort me just as deeply and give me great hope. Father, forgive me for the times that I have listened to the shallow, populist views of a of a happy, health, wealth, prosperity gospel. Forgive me for the times that I have feared the faces of men and wanted to conform my preaching to their desires or expectations. Father, help all of us to be so familiar with Your Word that we recognize intuitively, objectively, the voice of faithful servants who echo the faithful preacher who is Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us, each one of us, as we are all called to be our brother's keeper, to imitate Him in the preaching, in the speaking, in the ministry that each one of us has to the people that we share this world with. Bless us and lead us in paths of righteousness for Your name's sake. We praise You for breaking through and opening a way for us. Only help us follow You. Amen.